like real life. This one is unique, though, in that it's really the overflow of 30 years of life. This material in the Sacred Slow is the actual material I use when I have the joy of walking with people for 12 months of intentional mentoring. I thought if I could offer that contact that content in a more transferable form, then perhaps it could bless others. So I want to give you a couple of cautions if you ever decide to pick up this book or download it. In fact, I found out on Kindle it's 99 cents today if you'd like to download it. I want to ask you to spend no less than 12 weeks in this content. There are many amazing books that you can pick up and in a couple of minutes receive inspiration for the day. This book is more of a deep soak, so 12 weeks, all right? And I want to draw your attention to one other component. In the very back is where you're going to find the life scroll. The life scroll is the first six weeks of exercises. There's a brief reading, and then there's guidance for these exercises. This enables you to look at your life story sort of like the rings in a tree layer upon layer, and it's been a beautiful tool of healing. So I'd love to give this one away to someone who's willing to say, Alicia, I'll spend no less than 12 weeks. Really? All right. Okay. Bless you, honey. Take care. Absolutely. All right, family. We have been focusing our time together on a man named John, John the Baptist. And you may remember, if you were here on Wednesday, that our first study was on John's father and mother, whom we honor, John's mantle that we desire, and John's mentor that we want, generally nothing to do with whatsoever. Yes, we talked about John's mentor, the desert, and how the desert is a time-honored friend of the prophetic presence on this earth. Yesterday, we studied John's most often quoted sentence. Do you remember John chapter 3, verse 30? John said, he must increase and I must decrease. And we studied the concepts of heart clutter and the idol of uniqueness. So today, we're going to continue our study on the life of John. And we are going to examine his least often quoted sentence. Today, we're going to consider the concept of doubt in the life of faith. In a couple of weeks, hundreds of millions of people around the world are going to start preparing their hearts for Resurrection Sunday, preparing their hearts for the wonder of Christ's resurrection and everything that it means to us. And as we pause to soberly consider the cost of the cross and the cold of the tomb, wisdom would also invite us to consider in that space the disillusionment of the disciples. The passion week that we linger in to prepare our hearts to live in awe of Resurrection Sunday represented the most spiritually painful space of the early disciples' lives. And in those days, they experienced discouragement, they experienced doubt, they experienced disappointment, they even experienced despair. And that's a different kind of decrease, isn't it? John said he must increase, I must decrease. This isn't what John or we had in mind, is it? Let's consider what can sometimes be an uncomfortable subject. Doubt in the life of faith. Doubt. For some, it's when they know that God exists, but they're just not sure they still like him. For some, doubt is when they know that God is great, but they're not sure that he's good. For some doubt is when people have questions about God's words or God's ways or God's character or at times even God's existence. For some doubt is when beliefs that used to be so solid and so sure now feel alarmingly fuzzy.
fuzzy. It can be mild. And it can be monstrous. But I want to suggest to you today that in and of itself, doubt is not the enemy. I suggest to you that denial, far more than doubt, is the real demon. And here's why. If faith were a fairy tale and God were an illusion, then denial would be its friend. But since God is the ultimate reality, since he is truer than anything we could possibly imagine, since he is the ultimate form of what is real, honesty is a friend of faith. The more you and I can be honest about our lives, the more we can decrease the distance between us and what is truly real, the greater our capacity to have real intimacy with a real God, even when that reality is that we say, God, I've really, really got some questions in my heart today. Lord, I, I've got some questions that are unnerving me or some questions that are troubling me. Friends, some of us are going to innately have more questions than others. Some of us innately are going to feel more freedom than others to ask those questions. And I do not think that that is related to maturity and definitely not to intelligence. I think it probably has more to do with nature and nurture. I think it has a lot to do with how we're wired and how we were raised. My parents teased me that the very first word that ever came out of my mouth was why, not ma or dad. They say I opened my mouth and said why. So evidently I have been asking questions since I could speak and to be honest, not much has changed at all. But my dad nurtured that part of me. My dad would sit me down ever since I can remember, ever since I was tiny all the way to when I was an adult. And he would say, what's the daughter thinking? He called me the daughter. What's the daughter thinking? And I would tell him, and he would say, oh, those are good thoughts, daughter. What kind of questions are you asking? And I would tell him my questions, and he'd say, those are good questions, daughter. We would talk into the wee hours of the morning, pondering the mysteries of the universe. And I would share with him my concern about the injustices of society. We would wrestle with all these questions. And I don't remember the answers. You know what I remember? The safety. I remember how welcoming he was. I remember that nothing ever shocked him or shamed him or shut him down. Asking questions for me growing up was a way of growing relationship with my daddy. And so when God interrupted my atheistic existence and somebody came alongside and said, oh, by the way, God is now your father, my first thought was, oh, what a relief. Because what that meant to me is that my questions and my continual questioning didn't make him nervous. I have come to the conclusion that God is really rather secure. And I can tell you that over the last 30 years of asking a whole lot of questions with God, I don't remember all of the answers, and there are still so many that remain unanswered, but each and every time the process has been a threshold and on the other side has been greater sweeter and deeper intimacy with my God. So I'm going to ask you for the next few minutes to do something with me. That'll be easier for some than for others. I'm going to ask you to suspend any negative judgment you may have toward the substance we often call doubt. I want you to exercise what Jude calls us to in verse 22 when he said, be merciful to those who doubt. And consider the possibility that doubt isn't always the antonym of belief. That sometimes, for some people, it may actually be one of the growing pains of your faith. 
my husband and I, we invest our lives providing, as I mentioned, spiritual care, soul care for leaders around the world. And when we look at the future and we look in the past, do you know one of our greatest concerns for this generation? One of our greatest concerns for you is I think that for whatever reason you may have inherited a weak or sometimes absent framework from within which you can process spiritual pain. And so my hope today is that somehow the few words that I'm going to share will offer a bit of that for you. If there is one person today who is experiencing spiritual pain, perhaps in serious proportions, my hope is that you will be able to walk out of here with absolute confidence that God's love accompanies every question and everything that you are experiencing in your life right now. He is with you. So today, join me as we sit once again at the feet of this ancient man mentor, a man named John. And we're going to learn from him because John navigated his doubt with the same authenticity and integrity with which he navigated his life. So let's do, again, a bit of review from our last few days. We know that John was the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. He was the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. As we discussed earlier, we know that John was equipped to call his generation to prepare the way for the Lord because before he ever sounded that call publicly, he heeded that call privately. Before he prepared the way for the Lord in his generation, he prepared the way for the Lord within his own soul. And we looked at the mentor for that preparation from Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Can you help me again? Every time I put out my hand, I want you to say the desert. Are you ready? John grew in. John grew strong in. John grew strong in spirit in. So, oh, my soul, bless. Bless the hard places. Bless the barren spaces. There, God is preparing a way within us and will equip us to prepare the way for others. Scholars suggest that John's ministry at the Jordan lasted perhaps two years before he was imprisoned. Their guess is that he spent about a year imprisoned until he was beheaded, which brings us to our study today, to John's least often quoted sentence uttered from John's last place of residence from Herod's prison. Let's consider Matthew chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 2 and go through verse 6. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. I remember the very first time I heard anyone even bring this passage up. And they shared their perspective that John had no questions. They felt that John had no doubts, but that what John was doing was positioning his disciples close to Jesus. That he was just trying to get his disciples close enough to Jesus so they could see with their own eyes and hear with their own ears. And I remember thinking about that interpretation later on and studying. And I felt that perhaps it may have been a little incongruent with what I knew about John's character. Now, we know that diplomacy was not at the center of John's gifting cluster, yes? But directness was. 
And if you had a friend who was habitually direct, and they came to you and they said, would you go ask Joe if he's going to do that thing he said he was going to do, or if I need to find someone else? It wouldn't be because they wanted you to hear Joe's certainty. It would be because they were expressing their own uncertainty. I think that John asked a question because he had a question. John had a question about the identity of Jesus. Are you the one that we were waiting for? Or should we expect someone else? And I think by any definition, this might qualify as some form of doubt. I study from the New International Version. I just love studying the voice. And the word doubt appears in various forms 13 times in the New Testament in my NIV study Bible. Once it's inserted for clarification. So of the remaining 12 occurrences, they are translated from six different Greek words. And one of the things that I do when I'm studying, especially word studies, is I go and I see how those Greek words were translated in other contexts. And that was a fascinating study for me with this word. When the six Greek words that are translated doubt in the New Testament appear in different contexts and are translated differently, they're translated on quite a continuum. And I want you to try to picture this in your mind with me. Sometimes these words are translated as discerning, interpreting, weighing, thinking, hesitating, wavering, arguing, and rebelling. I'm going to say that again. Picture this continuum. Discerning, interpreting, weighing, thinking, hesitating, wavering, arguing, and rebelling, depending on the specific context. I think Bible translators, honestly, must be some of the most genius thinkers in our day. Their study of the culture and the language is just remarkable. And when they looked at these words in other contexts, we have this continuum emerge. So perhaps if we could somehow extract the social negative stigma that we often attach to doubt in the church, perhaps really the substance we're talking about is spiritual uncertainty. And whether or not that spiritual uncertainty evolves into discernment or decays into rebellion isn't a function of its existence, it's a function of its stewardship. In other words, having questions isn't the problem. Having questions isn't the problem. What we do with our questions is the challenge. What we do with our questions is what will help them evolve into discernment or decay into rebellion, which shifts our goal significantly, doesn't it? To this almost anxious effort sometimes I see among us of just deleting all doubt. I just, I shouldn't have any doubts. It repositions us to instead direct our questions, direct our uncertainty, direct our doubt to Jesus. That's the safe place. Friends, we are finite beings in relationship with an infinite God. And I think we can all agree that there's got to be some mystery in that gap. Yes? There has to be some uncertainty just by its very nature. But when there is no room in our faith for mystery, when there's no room in our faith for questions like John is asking, for moments and seasons of uncertainty, generally what we start doing is spiritualizing denial. We start spiritualizing revisionism because we think, oh, there's things I'm just not supposed to think about or feel or, or ask. Remember, he's rather secure. 
your heavenly father. He's the safe place for our questions. And honesty is a friend of intimacy with him. Allow me to repeat, even when honesty means we raise our hands and we say, God, I've got some questions. John the Baptist, he shows us a different way than denial. He shows us a way of dealing with uncertainty other than revisionism. And so let's study that way together this morning. We are not given the specifics of how John's question about Jesus' identity form. But it is clear that as he journeyed from the cool waters of the Jordan River to the cold walls of Herod's prison, that John experienced two drastic changes. First, he experienced a drastic change in what he was doing. He transitioned from the freedom and the relative success of his Jordan ministry to the confinement and to the hiddenness of prison in the prime of his life. The activities that filled his day normally came to a screeching halt within those prison walls. And very, very few of us instinctively respond well to being caged, do we? Especially when what we're caged with is ourselves. And we're not afforded the luxury of escaping uh, through the busyness and the hyper-productivity that so often and so successfully distracts us from the deeper questions in life. Transitions in general tend to sift our identity. They can often remove the things we've been leaning on for a sense of value. And we have to ask once again, what is it that makes us precious in God's sight. It sifts our self-concept, and you can even hear in his voice, it, can I, it sifts our God concepts. If I were to paraphrase, it sounds to me, and I'll come back to this at the end, as though John was saying, Jesus, I just need you to reconfirm your identity, please. Because if you're not who you thought, I, if you're not who I thought you were, I may not be who I thought I was. He experienced a drastic change in what he was doing. And secondly, he experienced a drastic change in what he was feeling. And this for our day can even be more of a challenge, can't it? In the realm of his senses, imagine he went from the waters of the Jordan to prison. To, and I want you to picture this, there are nine mentions of John's captivity, and all of them place him squarely in a prison. This was not house arrest, and this was not the Omni. I want you to think of first century prisons. They were brutal. And from what I was able to find in my research, think of four walls, think of a hole in the floor, and most notably, think of little to no light. Some of these cells had no light whatsoever. And not being able to see and not being able to feel is its own trial. And it's one that we're struggling through today. Allow me to offer an illustration. Several years ago, I was watching a young woman. Maybe she was in her late 20s. And I was watching her from a distance. She was a friend of a friend of a friend. And she was a beautiful worshiper, so, so responsive to the movement of the Holy Spirit. And she would weep, and she would volunteer, and she would share her faith with anybody that breathed. And then something would happen, like she'd get a letter from home, and there would be a difficult conversation with somebody or some conflict. And she wouldn't just become a little blue or a little sad. She would ricochet. And engage in outrageously risky, anonymous behavior. And then a few weeks later, she'd be back, weeping and worshiping and volunteering and witnessing, and she'd experience some discouragement and outrageously risky, anonymous behavior. It was baffling to me. I've been mentoring for decades, and I was not her mentor, but watching from a distance, I was just baffled. And I called a friend of mine, a wise biblical counselor, her name is Leah, and I said, Leah, do you have any insight into this? I've been wrestling with it for how long? She had 10 seconds. And she said, 
Oh, that's easy, Alicia. That's because her true addiction is to experience. Interesting concept, eh? Her true addiction was to experience. Her true addiction was to feeling something. So as long as she felt something in church, great. As long as she felt something at the altar, great. But if anything happened to flatten those feelings, if anything happened to cast a shadow on those positive emotions, she was going to go somewhere else to feel something else. Uh, friends, I wonder if this is not a common condition in our day. Sometimes I wonder if we inadvertently, we didn't mean to do this, but I wonder if we have trained an entire generation to decide whether or not they think God's in the room through the window of their emotions. We didn't mean to do it, but I wonder if we have taught an entire generation to make sure all the atmosphere is right so God will show up. I mentioned to you that my eldest, he's now 20, Jonathan, and he's on the autistic spectrum. As honest as honest can be. He is just innately honest. And Jonathan, it was several years ago, he had gone to one of those amazing citywide experiences, worship events. It was stunning. And so many people gave their lives to Christ. It was beautiful. And he came home and he said, Mom, I think that maybe I don't know God. And I said, I would love to hear your thoughts. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What questions do you have? And he said, well, I look around and everybody else seems to feel God. I can see it in their tears and their hands. And they say they feel God. They say they know God. He said, Mom, I don't feel God. Maybe that means I don't know God. Now, there wasn't one leader, there wasn't one pastor, there wasn't one director of that event that believed that, right? There wasn't one person in that place that would have stood up and said that. But maybe we've accidentally communicated that. Friends, I'm not anti-feeling and I'm not anti-emotion. I love feeling the presence of God. And I can tell you without hesitation the Lindsay's invite me to come or the leadership invites me to come because hopefully they feel that there's something that maybe God has deposited in me that will help you. But I come from my own soul here. There is something so sweet and so fresh and so pure that rests upon this school that every time I'm here, I am reminded of the sweetness of the presence of God. I love it, don't you? when my senses are smart enough to pick up on the reality of God's always profound presence. But do my senses create his presence? No. Which means that if I feel amazing or I feel nothing, it changes him not. Your greatest shout doesn't thicken God. Which means your greatest doubt does not thin him. From within the walls, the cold, cold walls of that prison, John probably felt less and saw less and heard less than perhaps any other time in his life. And as he experienced this abrupt change in what he was doing and this abrupt change in what he was feeling, this question about Jesus' identity moved to the surface of his mind and his heart. And here's what I want us to see. John took three steps to process his doubt. And Jesus did all the rest. Let's look at those steps together. The first thing John did, I've already mentioned repeatedly, but I will emphasize. The first thing John did was resist denial. He had a question. He was experiencing some uncertainty. And he didn't stuff his uncertainty. He didn't spin his uncertainty. Nor did he try to outrun or outgun his uncertainty. And additionally, notice that he didn't beat himself up or assume himself disqualified because of his uncertainty. He had a weighty question about Jesus' identity. 
and he was honest enough, real enough, and true enough to verbalize it. John resisted denial. The second thing we see John doing is that he expressed his uncertainty to a few carefully selected souls. And I don't know, and perhaps some of the professors here could weigh in on this, whether he would have had the option to write something sealed and confidential and have it sent to Jesus so only Jesus would have known. I, I'm not sure whether that would have been an option for him. But whatever the case, he chose to share some of it with just a few and I love the vulnerability that's represented there. Now, again, I'm sure they were carefully chosen, and it has to be carefully chosen in our life. But it seems to me that plastic Christianity's done the world precious little good. So I love the authenticity that's evidenced in this response. He shared it with just a few. And the third thing that John did is through those close friends, he directed his doubts to Jesus. He didn't just sit with them solo in his cell. And this is where we normally err. We're happy to share our faith with Jesus, but we tend to keep our doubts and our uncertainty to ourselves. John directed them Christward. He directed them to Jesus just like Mary and Martha did later, right? If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. The question underneath that all, I'm sorry, Jesus, where exactly were you? Your questions aren't the problem. What you do with them makes them friends or foes. Direct them to Jesus. And Jesus took it from there. Jesus received John's questions without offense. Jesus responded to John's questions with stories, not with shame. He gave John very tactile, concrete illustrations to confirm that what John saw and felt in the light was still true in the dark. And then if we were to keep reading, while John's disciples were taking the answer to Jesus, Jesus affirms John's honesty. What does he call them? This is when these words are spoken about John the Baptist, right on the heel of this question. He calls him more than a prophet, the greatest born among women, the Elijah that was to come. From his cell, John asked a question about the identity of Jesus, and Jesus, who weighs our hearts even more than our words, responded with now, I'd like to ask the worship team to join me. I still have a set of thoughts that I want to share with you. But I'd like us to prepare our hearts to direct some of our questions, Christ's word. Maybe this feels a little familiar to you. Maybe there are one or two or a few dozen in here. And if we were sitting across the table sharing some tea or some coffee, you'd say, it's colder than normal for me. It's darker than normal for me. I'm feeling less than I used to feel. And it's been really, really uncomfortable. Maybe this feels familiar to you. Honesty is a friend of intimacy with God. That substance you're wrestling with, that spiritual uncertainty that many have called doubt, it's probably one of the growing pains of faith. Don't mistake mystery for unbelief. Do not mistake the acknowledgement of mystery for unbelief. Questions like the kind John asked can be sacred invitations to nearness with God. And when you and I, like John, don't deny our questions and are willing to share them with a few trusted souls, when we direct them, as John did, to Jesus, we're in really, really great company, friends. Abraham, in Genesis 18, verse 23, asked, God, are you really going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked? 
Moses in Psalm 90 verse 13 said, Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. King David in Psalm 13 verse 2 said, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? In my favorite Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 1, You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak to you about your justice. <laughs> Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? Abraham, Moses, David, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Peter also doubted, didn't he? And he sank into the waters when he took his eyes off of Jesus. And then he went on to preach on the day of Pentecost and lead the early church. Thomas also doubted when others testified about Jesus' bodily resurrection. And then he went on to be the first person to refer to Jesus as my God and to head east toward India to bring the gospel. So evidently, friends, doubters can turn into really great leaders. <laughs> doubters can make really great prophets. Doubters can be heroes of the faith as they develop the discipline of directing their questions Christward. Allow me to read to you back to 40 Days of Decrease that I read from yesterday. I'm going to read two pages, pages 21 and 22. And as I do, I invite you to begin resting, resting in what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, responding. You can stay at your seats if you'd like. You're welcome to come and pray. And then in a few minutes, I'll be dismissing you. Jesus' response assured John of more than Jesus' identity. Jesus' words affirmed John's identity as well. Returning to their mentor, John's disciples testified, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, Isaiah 61 is being fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus. Jesus was who John thought he was, the Messiah, which meant conversely that John was who God said he was, the prophet sent to prepare the way for the Lord. Such a calling is understandably easier to believe by the waters of the Jordan than from within the walls of a prison. And perhaps that is, in part, what can make questioning so painful. For the faithful Christ follower, self-concept is inextricably connected to God-concept. We are valuable because God is creator. We are forgiven because God is redeemer. If God is not who he thought he was, then who are we? Many of us dare not even ask the questions. Do we fear that God will fail the test? One scholar teaches that in Jewish culture, quote, it's an act of reverence to ask questions of the story. The Jews are confident that the story is strong enough to be tried and tested. Around the table, a Jewish child has, that's a good question, drummed into his or her soul, not, shh, you don't ask that question. Questions are as sacred as answers, end quote. We weaken, not strengthen, our faith when we silence sincere questions. Faith in Christ is not an airy substance that rests on unquestioning souls. Biblical faith is muscular, thickened more through trials than through ease. The author of our faith is more than able to address the identity crises. His unexpected words and ways may trigger in our souls. John heard within Jesus' response the same striking answer that we hear today. Who is Jesus? Jesus is more than we thought, hoped, or imagined. His wildness is a source of wonder, not of worry. His righteousness is deeper than the oceans. His goodness is higher than the heavens. His faithfulness exceeds our comprehension. So what does that make us? Loved. Who are we? 
we are Christ's beloved. We are loved when making bold proclamations near cool waters under sunny skies. And we are loved when asking sincere questions in dark cells and darker times. We, you, are loved. So as his beloved, I invite you for the next few moments. Direct your attention. Direct your questions to your Savior. Honesty directed toward Christ is a friend of your intimacy with God. Let's wait in his presence for a few moments as the worship team leads us, and then I'm going to close us with a prayer, and after that prayer, you're dismissed. Thoughts define me, you're inside me, you're my reality. Closer than the skin on my bone. You're closer than the song on my tongue. Your thoughts define. 